Okay, hello my friends, we are live. I apologize for those of you who may have been waiting for me. I'm starting a few minutes late due to some technical difficulties because it is one of those days, one of those weeks. So welcome, thank you for joining me. If we haven't yet met yet, my name is Emma Luzzi. I'm at Blue Sky Philanthropy and I work with fundraisers and nonprofit leaders to help them raise more major gifts for their missions. So if you're just joining me today, we are going to be talking about three common fears that often arise when we are engaging in our fundraising. I'm gonna be talking about what they are, how to spot them and how to do a little bit of work to recognize and overcome those fears. So I'm gonna be honest with you for a moment and I'm gonna tell you that I really had some second thoughts actually about going live today to talk about fear in the light of the horrifying attack on the US Capitol yesterday. I wondered whether or not it was appropriate to be talking about fear as it relates to fundraising. And I decided I wanted to go ahead with this scheduled live as I had planned it largely because I think that it's really important that we have the space and pay attention to talking about our feelings and emotions that arise, that, that come up when we are fundraising, especially fear, having space to talk about fear, having space to recognize fear and how it can arise in the course of our work, I think is a really important conversation for us to have. So if you're just joining us, welcome. We're gonna be talking about three common fears that can arise when we are fundraising. I actually have some slides to share with you today. So wish me luck and I'm hoping my tech issues aren't gonna be continuing today. So I'm gonna go ahead and share those slides with you so we can get started. While I do that, I'd love to hear from you. If you're joining us live, please drop a hello below so I know you're here. If you're joining us for the replay, you can use the hashtag replay. And as I chat, if you have any thoughts or questions, I would love to hear from you. Go ahead and drop those below. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. All right, I think that looks good. Okay, so I'm going over to my slide deck. Hello, Tamisha, lovely to see you here. Welcome, welcome. Okay, so I'm gonna go over here and uh, get us started here. So I'm talking about fear as it arises when it comes to our fundraising. And I wanted to pick us off by talking a little bit about why this happens, right? So mother nature has basically made us highly threat reactive. This is really normal. She wants us to be alarmed at a thousand paper tigers in order to avoid missing that one single real tiger who might be about to pounce. So this is often referred to as the paper tiger effect or paper tiger phenomenon. This is a phrase commonly used by one of my favorite uh, folks working around uh, neuroscience and neuroplasticity, Dr. Rick Hansen. And this has really evolved as a protective mechanism over millions of years of evolution, right? Turns out we are hardwired in a way that makes us essentially really clearly remember and give more weight to events and experiences that we perceive as negative over those that we perceive as positive. This is called the negativity bias, right? So I wanna be really clear here, uh, when I'm talking about paper tigers and I'm talking about imagined threats, I am not saying that there are not some very real threats out there right now. So I already had mentioned we witnessed a horrifying attack on the US Capitol yesterday. We're in the middle of a pandemic. A lot of us are dealing with a uh, rise or more attention to the growing threat of racist violence right now. So there are some very, very real threats, real tigers out there right now. So I wanted to start off by acknowledging that actually. And I also want to encourage you to have some compassion for yourself today. Not only today, but every day, but I think today it's especially important, right? Have some compassion for yourself today, have some compassion for others and for your team members because a lot of us are really struggling right now. So I just wanted to make that note before I continued in, in talking about 
fear and neg negativity bias, because I think that's a really important piece of the puzzle when we're talking about dealing with and managing our fear as, as it arises is just having that compassion for yourself. Okay, so, all right. Wanted to share this great quote from also from Dr. Rick Hansen. He talks about negativity bias and how it actually makes us overestimate threats, underestimate resources, our opportunities, and underestimate resources. And this is really relevant, I think, when it comes specifically to fundraising, right? So our, we've got a really important job here, right? With negativity bias, we need to determine the difference between very real threats the real tigers that we need to take action on to protect ourselves and the perceived threats, the paper tigers that may be getting in the way of us taking action. So I wanted to make that important distinction before we moved on. And I also wanted to note your brain is really just doing its job when you feel fear. It's hardwired in. Everyone feels it. We don't like to talk about it a lot and we often don't like to admit it. And in the context of fundraising, I think we get scared of what we could, we imagine may happen, right? And this happens particularly when we push outside of our comfort zone. Maybe when we're trying something new that makes us feel a little bit uncomfortable. But if you've worked with me or chatted with me before, you will know I'm a really big advocate of the importance of taking action, and making sure that you are expanding that comfort zone, right? That is really the key to growing your fundraising. So um, here's the thing too I wanted to note is that fear never goes away. If you're continuing to challenge yourself to grow, you will continue to feel fear. Happens to me, <laughs> happens to the best of us. And it's actually a good sign that you're continuing to challenge yourself. OK, so let me dive right in. I'm going to talk about three common fears you can expect to arise. Just going to pop over, make sure everything's OK here on because uh, I can't see your comments as I chat. Hello. Welcome. Oh, so nice to see so many friendly faces. Maureen, Fiona, uh, thanks for joining us today. And my wonderful co-pilot Shanna is with us as well. If you're wondering how I am presenting live and also uh, responding to your comments. She is a great part of our team. So thanks so much for jumping in and joining us, everybody. And uh, I will pop back in. Unfortunate thing about StreamYard is it doesn't let me run my slides and see your comments at the same time. So I'll just pop back and forth there to make sure uh, I'm not missing everything. So I wanna start off with the common fear that comes up in fundraising. And that is fear of judgment. So this one really came up for me recently. I wrote about how introverts make really great major gift fundraisers. And that's uh, something I'm sticking with. Introverts are some of the best major gift fundraisers. So I created this post and I actually ended up getting a lot of critical comments when I posted this on Facebook. Very interesting. And when I read one of them, I could actually feel fear arising in me. I could feel my heart starting to race. I could feel heat rising in my face. I had all these feelings, even though I knew logically I had nothing to be afraid of. Someone making a cheeky comment on Facebook wasn't a real true threat to me, but I was having a really normal human reaction to feeling judged, right? So, I want you to know if that has happened to you, you're not alone, super normal. And I mentioned this because I think a really important key in working with fear is actually to start noticing how it shows up in your body, right? So neuro, I, I always have trouble saying this word, neuro, and, and, no, I'm not even gonna try, Jill Bolt Taylor. You'll know Jill Bolt Taylor. Uh, she is an author and a, I'm gonna try it again, neuroanatom, and anatomist, neuroanatomist, thank you very much. I'm fearing you judging me right now because I can't see neuroanatomist. So Jill Bolt Taylor, who is a wonderful author and thought leader uh, uh, around a lot of these ideas, talks about the physiological lifespan of an emotion in your body and your brain. And this was really surprising to me to read and it really helped me. It takes about 90 seconds for an emotion to arise and dissipate in your body, right? So all those sensations that you're feeling when fear comes up, 
uh, adrenaline, hotness in the face, tightness in your throat, a rapid heartbeat. Those are very common ones, maybe different for you. Those all arise, peak, and dissipate on their own, which I always feel is a great comfort. And the lifespan of those is 90 seconds, right? So I think it's really important for us to start thinking about this, start noticing how this arises in our in our bodies, and also start recognizing that even though it can feel very terrible at the moment, those emotions can typically tend to, uh, you know, evaporate on their own in about 90 seconds, right? So I want to talk about how does fear of judgment specifically show up in fundraising? And I'm thinking about it in the context of major gifts right now, actually. So I see this often and I, have, I hear this in conversations, especially one to one conversations I have with uh, consulting and coaching clients is that even the most seasoned fundraising professionals can be uh, feel a little intimidated by working with wealthy donors. That is a facet of this fear, right? We create stories in our head as fundraisers about how we may be judged and found wanting by donors, right? And I think there's a really great antidote to this. It's pretty simple. I like to remember that most people are actually too busy <laughs> thinking about themselves and probably their own fear of being judged to think about you, right? So that's something that I find to be a bit of a comfort. People are too busy thinking about themselves to really think of you, including focusing on their own fears of being judged. Because as I said, this simply doesn't go away, even if you are seasoned or more experienced. But as I did also say, can tend to, um, uh, our comfort zones can also tend to grow over time as long as we're going ahead and, and taking action and, and um, ourselves in some uncomfortable situations so we can grow. All right, my second fear I want to talk about in the context of fundraising is fear of rejection, okay? And this can be a really, really big one when it comes to major gifts, especially. It can actually sometimes prevent us from properly soliciting our donors and then getting stuck in that never ending cycle of cultivation, who has been there? probably all of us, right? That you just can't get to the point um, where you're at a level of comfort where you can go ahead and put yourself in that position of potentially being rejected because you're making an ask of a donor. I find this also can show up in smaller ways that prevent us from taking action, right? So I think, for example, for me, one of the things I've often uh, struggled with in my major gift fundraising is having an intense dislike of the phone. Yes, this, this is a long standing fear and one that I have actually gotten over over the course of time. Um, but, you know, I think that this is something that can really show up and is really helpful just to be aware of. Or you may have a fear, for example, of using video <laughs> or going live. And it is scary, right? But it is only through taking action and sort of becoming a little more comfortable with that potential fear of rejection that our comfort zone around it grows. So it really can take practice, but as we take action to do this work, despite our own discomfort, discomfort hearing no, does actually get easier. In fact, I often tell my students, when you're qualifying donors for your major gift program, a no is actually very good news in many ways because you've gotten a clear message about where this donor needs to live within the, your organization and you can move on and spend your time on a potential uh, donor who may want a deeper relationship, more of a one-to-one -one relationship with your organization. So. A little bit of a reframe there, sometimes hearing no is actually very good news. So my fear number two is a fear of rejection. As promised, just popping back over, making sure everything looks okay. All right, no judgment from you, Tamisha. Thank you so much because I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't pronounce. I'm neuroanatomist. I got it now, it's just practice, right? All right, oh, thank you. I love seeing all of your lovely faces here and hearing all of your support and, uh, uh, welcome, welcome. If you're just joining us, we're talking about three common fears that can arise when you are fundraising. And I'm going to move forward to my final fear, number three. 
And wow, this one can absolutely wreak some serious havoc on your fundraising. And I find it actually shows up most powerfully at the organizational level, and that is fear of scarcity, right? It can also be one of the toughest fears to address. And I'd say it actually is even at a sectoral level, even than just at an organizational level, is that this is a sector-wide problem, the, the scarcity thinking, and it's really, really holding back our fundraising. And I think if we don't recognize and address it, what can happen is it can become even um, more intense, especially during times of uncertainty as we move into 2021, and we're not entirely sure on what necessarily lies ahead with our donors. So what I see is scarcity mentality, it can really feed into that sense of competing with other organizations or other fundraisers for what's really perceived to be a very limited pot, right? So we have to get our own piece of the pie. And we're competing against others to have that. I can see this actually happening internally as well at some organizations, especially larger organizations, when you see silos developing, right? That can be a huge problem and a really, really big barrier to raising more major gifts. When silos, for example, develop between annual giving and major gifts at larger shops, um, because what happens is then, you know, if, it, if this is mine and it's about meeting my goal and there is that overall organizational culture of scarcity, what that can end up doing is getting in the way of collaboration between departments in order to actually grow a healthier pipeline for potential major gifts. So fear of scarcity really shows up in a lot of problematic ways when it comes to our fundraising at the individual, organizational, and sectoral level. level. And I think the most important thing I want to emphasize here is that fundraising is not a zero sum game. It is not a limited pie, right? In fact, I believe through better fundraising, we can actually grow that pie of donors. So I think that's another mindset shift and a reframe really like to encourage you to take if you see the sphere of scarcity arising uh, in your organization or actually in yourself as well. And I want to say all of this is so, so normal. I'm talking about it, but guess what? I also experience fear of scarcity sometimes as well. I also experience fear of rejection. So this happens to all of us. And I think the most important part is really about recognizing it as, you know, as something that will arise in the course of our work, uh, starting to be aware of it, starting to recognize when it happens, and then just addressing it. Being aware and rec recognizing it is uh, the most important first step, I believe, in, in um, tackling some of these fears and making sure that they don't derail your fundraising in 2021. Whew, I'm going to take a breath and a sip of my water. If anyone has any questions or wants to weigh in with their thoughts, I'd love to hear from you. Go ahead and drop that below. And I am going to take a moment to wrap up. So I hope you found this helpful. I want to encourage you, if you're someone who wants to find a little more support, who wants to find a supportive community to start looking at some of these pieces around managing your mindset, addressing fear as it arises when it comes up when you're working on your major gifts, I am going to be opening doors to my online program, Major Gift Master Plan, in just a few, I was going to say few short weeks, but it is in fact probably more like a few short days. So I want to encourage you if you're somebody who's really interested in growing that sustainable, reliable revenue from major gifts this year, please go ahead and visit my website. It's blueskyphilanthropy.com. You can sign up for an interest list there and you will be the first to know when doors open. In fact, I even give you a couple of days head start before I open uh, the program to other folks. There are limited spots. I always like to keep this program uh, very intimate so that I can pay a lot of one-to-one -one attention to everyone in the program. Uh, so please do go ahead and check that out if 
it sounds like something that may be interesting to you to help you really get that head start on creating the fundraising results you want in 2021. And I do see a couple of folks here who are actually students of the program, um, including Maureen, hello. And Maureen is actually raising a really good question now. Fear of scarcity sometimes comes from uh, the board, right? That absolutely, I see that very frequently coming it coming from um, from the board level, and uh, I think we saw that actually at the especially at the beginning of the pandemic, we saw a lot of uh, boards and senior leaders. It was back. This was backed up with some research from the think tank Rogari that's based in, in the UK, they did some really interesting research on um, fundraising and the pandemic. And what they found was that a lot of uh, board members and senior leaders were making decisions. I don't know if they quite said that were based in scarcity. I'll call it that, my words, not theirs. But they were really decisions that were based around a fear of uh, offending donors, a fear of reaching out to donors um, uh, during the pandemic. So we saw a lot of organizations actually either pause fundraising and not, you know, restart it or, um, you know, make some really dramatic cuts or perhaps what I will even be so bold as to call poor decisions based out of fear. Um, especially at the beginning of the pandemic. So this can be really, really tricky to address, especially if you've got one board member who uh, may be escalating things. So I always have a few recommendations about this in terms of managing up. So um, my first recommendation in a case like this is to actually share as much uh, share as much research and as, as many facts as possible to kind of address and or counter any fears they may be raising, right? So um, a common fear is, is that, you know, from boards is that donors will be offended and incensed if we ask them for support right now. There's a lot of research out there that counters that, including some great research from um, Blue Frog out of the UK. I mentioned the Rogari group as well, uh, as well as a really interesting um, study that I often cite recently from Campbell Rinker, which was looking specifically at high dollar donor donors and their behavior during the pandemic. And what all research is pointing towards, not exclusively, the majority of research, especially with higher, uh, higher dollar donors, is pointing towards the fact that, that major donors are planning to maintain and or increase uh, their giving in the upcoming months. And it's also, um, indicating especially for high dollar donors is that the majority of them are not actually identifying as experiencing economic stress right now right so I think the facts are really important for folks because what's happening sometimes with board members who are reacting from fear is they are creating stories right they're creating stories that are not necessarily founded in reality about what the donor's response could be if we're reaching out to them so all this said, it's still very important as uh, you know, we've discussed on a number of different occasions to make sure that you're maintaining really strong and healthy relationships with your donors um, and checking in with them and seeing how they're doing, um, you know, and not just sort of going, going in for the ask without having been in touch, for example, you know, for the entire year. But I think it's really important in what we're seeing for sure, just even in, in terms of fundraising results are up last year. And so what we're seeing is uh, the results are bearing out what the theory was at the, at the beginning is that, you know, folks are going to continue giving. It's happening at all levels. If anyone is watching right now who has experience with this, I'd love to hear you weigh in. Um, but for most of my clients, for all of the research I've seen, um, even between whether it's about donor attitudes or about actual results, year end results aren't quite in yet. Uh, but all of um, the feedback we're seeing and getting is that uh, fundraising is up significantly last year. So <laughs> unfortunately for organizations that did um, have that knee jerk reaction, 
of uh, pausing, of cutting back, of not proceeding with um, effective fundraising as usual, uh, unfortunately probably missed out on an incredibly important window um, of fundraising opportunity. And I hope that was not necessarily any of you, but I also wanna say it's never too late, right? It's never too late to get things back on track and start reaching out to your donors again as well. For those donors who truly, truly care about your cause, um, they are always going to want to give if they are able. And many, many people are absolutely prioritizing. Oh, thank you, Shanna is wonderful. She actually shared um, that um, uh, the study I was just talking about, it's on my website, uh, the Campbell Rinker study. And the, unfortunately the links have been unwieldy for me to read out loud, but um, I will drop that. Uh, below so folks can have a look at that if that's helpful but i would say first things first i would do maureen is um make sure that you're really addressing these fears with research with facts case studies can be really effective too if there's an organization that your board particularly admires for example um you can actually have somebody uh here here's another effective idea you can even bring in um, somebody externally, let's say from another organization. I've had a great, um, I've had a great results with that. Is bringing in somebody else to talk about, um, you know, to to talk about what's been effective for them. Again, in a way that really is countering what those fears are, and is presenting, you know, case studies, research, and facts that kind of counter those fears. Right. I think, um, you know, I think it's important here, I talked a bit about self-compassion earlier. I think it's important that we also have empathy for others and recognize where these fears are coming from, right? It, it, it's, it, I think it's very natural for boards who, you know, for whom this is basically, they have ultimate uh, fiscal responsibility for the organization, right? So maybe very natural that, that they have some fears arising right now in these uncertain times. And it's an important job for us as fundraisers to actually be able to support them and address that. So I would say yeah, bringing in, uh, bringing in any sort of facts, presentations, case studies. If you haven't had a chance to have one to a one-to-one -one discussion with them, that can be really helpful too. Just, just kind of talking a little bit more about what they see as, uh, you know, what they see as the way forward. Sometimes hearing folks out can be really helpful as well. Sometimes I've found in, in doing those sort of stakeholder interviews with board members that maybe when you take it a few layers down, there may be a completely, you know, different and or valid concern that is actually underlying a, underlying a fear that's arising. So this can be really helpful having one-to-one -one conversation, bringing in someone external, if there's, if you have an external influencer or another organization that you feel is really effective. So uh, Maureen saying, you have experienced a rise in donations, congratulations. Um, so I know it does, I, I'll tell you what, fear actually doesn't make sense. I, I saw this last year a lot during the pandemic is that even in the face of um, clear results, uh, even like concrete results, including an increase in donations, that um, we're not necessarily, and I speak as us in general as humans, are not necessarily like behaving logically in, in, in the face of our fear, because that's also how we operate. So um, yeah, I think that that is definitely a challenge for sure. And I would say just having empathy for folks and understanding where this is coming from can be can be really helpful. Sorry, there's much going on in my house, including barking dogs. Um, so um, yeah, I think um, I think in that case, and yes, that's what I was going to say that we saw that happen. Um, we saw that happen last year, and that's what I wanted to conclude with. That's a great example of negativity bias in action, actually. And Rick Hansen, again, um, talks about negativity bias. He uses this beautiful metaphor, and he says, basically, um, positive news or good news uh, is basically like um, Teflon. Our brain's like Teflon with good news. So it sort of slides off. But with negative news, our brain's like Velcro. So what happens is you could have 10 pieces of positive news, but guess what? They all gonna slide off our Teflon brain and the one piece of bad news is gonna stick like Velcro. So this is really natural again, if negativity bias in action. Um, so it is very normal to see someone even in the face of evidence saying like, okay, increase in donations, I'm seeing all the facts. Um, it, it can sometimes be that one piece of bad news that got stuck in the Velcro. 
if that makes sense. So I know this doesn't necessarily help you with your current situation, but it can sometimes help us be more patient as well uh, when we're working, uh, especially with volunteers, just recognizing that this is what ha what's happening. Very natural for negativity bias to cause us to pay less attention to good news and for bad news to stick much more on our Velcro brain. So yeah, I, I and Maureen, you raise a really good it point too around this idea of working with folks from the private sector who are in business, who expect our nonprofits to operate exactly like business. And that's a big challenge. It's not one I necessarily have an easy answer for um, because I do see that arising at other organizations is that there is this attempt to kind of, um, you know, take you know, take the whole business model and kind of overlay it on our nonprofits and it doesn't necessarily make for um, fundraising success. <laughs> I'll be quite frank about that. So yeah, well, good luck with it. I don't know if it's something you'll be able to resolve immediately because it's pretty complex in terms of, uh, in terms of, um, you know, all of the workings of our brain and that negativity bias coming, but, you know, do be patient with them. And um, perhaps a one-to-one -one conversation might be the next, uh, might be the next step doing a bit of a mini stakeholder interview with them in terms of, you know, what do you see as the way forward right now? Um, and, you know, where do you see our opportunities lying and possibly steering that board member um, into a sort of more positive direction or mindset. So hopefully that helps. Um, we're at the 30 minute mark. So I am actually going to wrap up now, unless anyone else has any other questions or comments they wanted to um, go ahead and drop below. And as I said, at the beginning. Um, please do, if you're catching up on the replay and you have any questions, go ahead and use that hashtag replay. I always pop back in and, and keep an eye on things and uh, I'd love to hear from you and hear more about your perspective as well on uh, these interesting issues and challenges we've talked about today. All right, my friends, I am going to pause here. I wish you, which I didn't at the beginning, a uh, very happy 2021. I am very much looking forward to working with you in the upcoming year. It's gonna be an interesting one, but I know that we can get through this together. So I uh, hope you found this helpful today and I will look forward to possibly seeing you next week. Is it almost an extension of our conversation today? I have a special guest joining me, Mimosa Kabir, who is the manager of the Capital Campaign at uh, one of the world's most highly respected documentary film festivals. She is gonna be joining us and we are gonna be talking about something very closely related to fear and fundraising and that is the imposter phenomenon and specifically how it shows up when we're working on our major gift fundraising. So please join me next week. Have a look out for uh, that notice. I believe we're gonna be live on Wednesday at 1 p.m. EST um, just to accommodate both of our schedules next week. So thank you so much for joining us and uh, look forward to seeing you again next time. All right, bye-bye everybody.